All right, well, we are going to begin. Welcome to the Louisiana Board of Regents Dual Enrollment Policy Webinar. I see we've got some hands raised. I'm hoping that we have all of our listeners are able to hear us. Um, everyone has been muted upon entry. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But before we begin, I just wanted to acknowledge um, how challenging of a time this is. And we hope that you and your family are doing well during this time. So thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to join us for this webinar on our interim dual enrollment policy. Um, a few webinar instructions due to bandwidth. Everyone is on mute um, as well as no uh, video. We're asking that you, um, to ensure we're able to respond to the questions, please submit your questions via the chat in Zoom. Um, if possible, include your email address. Board of Regents staff will be working to answer your question while on this call, as well as following up via email if we are unable to answer during this call. Also, the webinar is being recorded and we will be uploading the webinar um, to Regents website, which the link is here. Just to get us started for today's webinar, we will be breaking our webinar into three parts, uh, providing an overview of this interim dual enrollment policy. Uh, the first part, we will be talking about our current dual enrollment guidance for students currently enrolled, uh, followed by a frequently asked questions. Next, we will talk about prospective dual enrollment guidance for the 2020-2021 academic year. And then um, we will talk about post-secondary SSPS data entry guidance. Throughout the presentation, we'll be pausing for questions. And we're asking that, again, all questions be submitted in the chat. Please include your email address. Um, and if we are not able to answer the question during the webinar, we will be following up one-on-one -on -one as needed. Um, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Malin Baker. I am an Institutional Research Associate here at Board of Regents. Um, I have several other colleagues who have joined us on the line and they will be also participating in this presentation. After this, Dr. Susanna Craig, a Senior Associate, will be joining us, followed by Dr. Lupe La Madrid, Senior Policy Analyst, as well as Dr. Randall Frumfield, our Deputy Commissioner, um, helping manage our uh, chat is Carol Landry, who is on the line here with us at Regents, and we also want to extend our appreciation to the Department of Education, who has been partnering with us in this work. Uh, Meredith McGovern, Education Program Consultant, is on the line and will help us, assisting us with any questions we receive uh, specific to Department of Education. And we also have on the line um, Adam Lowe from Education Strategy Group, who has been supporting us in the Dual Enrollment Task Force, which I will um, mention towards the end of the webinar. Right now, I'm gonna go ahead and um, switch off to Dr. Susanna Craig, who's gonna provide the overview of the interim dual enrollment policy. Great, good afternoon. Uh, we are so happy to um, have an opportunity to talk with you about dual enrollment and uh, the reason for needing this webinar is due to this COVID-19 crisis. Um, it's unprecedented. And uh, basically the teams at the Board of Regents and the Louisiana Department of Education have been working together to help solve for these issues as they arise. Um, there are two sets of students that we will be discussing today, and that's those current students in dual enrollment courses, as well as pr prospective students um, who are planning to take dual enrollment courses in the 2021 school year. So um, as we've been discussing this issue, these issues and collaborating with the Department of Education, um, these are some of the complications that have come up. First of all, for our students, the learning um, has been disrupted. Uh, disruption of learning, and it could be from a variety of sources. It could be that the student themselves have um, their access to technology is limited. It could be the faculty members access to uh, technology is limited or the high school um, 
teachers. I mean, lots of reasons why um, the learning could be disrupted in this process. There could be um, a limited ability to complete the course by the end of the semester. And this could be technology access, but it could also be uh, bandwidth access when you have multiple parties, possible parents working in the home, um, multiple st uh, students in the home uh, trying to use the same um, bandwidth access. It becomes challenging for students. And then uh, the third piece is the fact that of the cancellation of ACT, SAT, or other tests. Um, the, without these tests, it would be difficult to place students. And so we want to talk with you about how we're planning to, to work on this moving forward. So all students who are currently enrolled in dual enrollment with the consultation of their school leadership may choose three options for course completion. The first option is the student may complete the course online in the 2020 spring semester and finish with a final grade. The second option is that student may transition the course to in progress or incomplete, but the student must complete this by August 31st of 2020. So there's a couple of caveats to this. Um, the student and the high school counselor need to be in close communication with the institution for which the student is enrolled to make sure that this is an option. And two, things to consider. If the student does not complete the course, then this student, it could result in a failing grade and might negatively impact TOPS for that student. Um, and so it's, it's very important that um, the student has an opportunity to think about this process. The third option is that the student can withdraw from the college side of the course uh, via an administrative withdrawal. And if this administrative withdrawal is used, no grades will be posted to the student's college transcript or record. Um, the administrative withdrawal deadline is set by the post-secondary institution. And so if the student chooses to withdraw from the high school portion of the course, then, and the course is needed for the top score, the student may need to retake the course. So there's lots of nuances with these three different options. It's very important that you are in close communication with the students as well as the institutions that the students are enrolled. Okay. So, Lupe? I'm right here. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you today about some FAQs. Uh, we tried to put together some fast facts for you uh, that would address some of your most pressing questions as you hear about our policy. How long will the three options apply for current dual enrollment students? So students currently enrolled in dual enrollment, as Dr. Craig said, have those three options that they can um, select from. If they complete the course, the deadline would be, of course, the, the day to submit grades for spring of 2020. Then in progress and administrative withdrawals will be available until August 31st. So that students have a little bit more time to deal with those two options if they are selected. Question number two or FAQ number two, will there be refunds for administrative withdrawals? 
post-secondary institutions are not required to issue a refund for an, administ an administrative withdrawal due to the COVID-19 crisis. Then finally, what is the deadline to pursue an administrative withdrawal? Deadlines to seek an administrative withdrawal should um, it are under the purview of the specific institution. So what my suggestion would be would be that you contact the college campus or university uh, in order to, uh, to ask for that specific information and the processes that uh, you need to go through in order to, to get the, an administrative withdrawal. We're going to pause here for a second and we would like to open up um, for quotes. Oh, realized I have one more FAQ to discuss with you. Um, how will dual enrollment courses be graded for students who are currently enrolled in the spring of 2020? So this is divided into two, into two areas, two populations. Every student currently enrolled and continuing in the spring of 2020 course are going to receive a grade. In consultation with school leadership, graduating high school seniors may have the opportunity to change from the A through F grading scale to a pass-fail option uh, for the course that is going to appear on the college uh, transcript. A, a note of caution, if the student chooses the pass-fail option, this may impact students' future college GPA and scholarship eligibility. Because with pass-fail, um, you, you get credit for the course, but you do not get any um, additional quality points for to move your GPA up. So it's kind of a status quo um, option. Uh, now we're going to pause for a second, and uh, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, put them in the, um... okay. Okay, I see that we have a couple of questions here that have come up right away. Um, are the three options final and official? or are they going up for the BOR April 22nd vote? Just trying to understand if it's official or still a work in progress from the emails that I've seen. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, at this point, they are proposed and they will be final and official upon ratification by the board on April, on the April 22nd meeting. But we've been working very hard uh, together with the campuses as well as our board and uh, what we are presenting to the board, uh, we have a very high expectation that those will be approved. Okay, let's see if we've got. Okay, we have another question on the dual enrollment coordinator at Ponchatoula, where I'm also one of the high school counselors. I'm concerned about one of the options for 2021 enrollment. I believe the subject level teacher is a better determinant of a student's ability. I also worry about the impact of requiring the counselor to make the determination will have on the student counselor relationship. Okay. Um, so is this the, we're talking about the grading issue still, I believe. So, um, or are we, I'm not sure if I could get a little clarification. Well, let me, um, let me just jump in. We're going to talk a little bit uh, later in the PowerPoint about, um, about some of these options. And I think that that's, um, uh, Denise, what, that's something that certainly you and the counselor at your school can discuss about the best way to handle this, this recommendation. And again, so what we're going to do is really, um, uh, if we don't get to your question today, remember that we will be emailing question answers out to everyone. Um, Melinda, I think there were a couple of other questions not in the chat side, but on the Q&A side that I think that um, we may need to handle. Okay. 
All right, um, I wasn't able to get to those in the Q&A just yet. Um, what I'm gonna do and propose, if we haven't answered or responded to it yet, let's go ahead um, and we will circle back. I see we have about five different questions in the Q&A. Remembering, please put in your email address if we haven't responded. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask my team to um, be reviewing your questions. We're gonna come back to another pause in just a moment to respond to a few of those questions. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and go to this next option or the next component of the policy as my team kind of filters through your questions, starts to get ready to respond. So the next section of the policy is for discussing for the policy for prospective dual enrollment for 2020-2021 academic year. Um, this applies for students wishing to initiate or continue their participation in dual enrollment for the upcoming 2021 academic year. Uh, students may be eligible to enroll in academic courses for the master articulation matrix uh, if they have met the following criteria. First, the student needs a minimum of 2.5 cumulative GPA. Second, which includes two options. The first option is a subject specific minimum score on any assessment listed in Academic Affairs Policy 2.22, which I will share on the next slide, or a counselor recommendation based on overall student performance and grade trends in the subject. Here we have the minimum scores listed in Academic Affairs Policy 2.22. Any of these assessments apply as the minimum score option to the interim policy. And again, here you see the two options. The first option is a 2.5 cumulative GPA. Second is any assessment in the academic affairs policy 2.22 chart or a counselor recommendation based on overall student performance and grade trends in this subject. Now I will transition back to Dr. Lupe for some frequently asked questions while my team is looking through uh, some of those previous frequently asked questions in the previous slide. Dr. La Madrid. Thank you so much, Milan. So let's talk about, um, does this policy apply to the spring 2021? And the answer is yes. This policy applies for the 2021 academic year. So if you've got dual enrollment students who have questions about enrolling in dual enrollment for the next academic year for 2021, then this policy uh, is in place for those students um, for the whole year. Um, does a student need a composite ACT score to enroll in a DE course? And this is one of the, the biggest changes. And uh, obviously, in light of the cancellation of um, the ACT, or actually the, the postponement of the ACT and the, the cancellation of the SAT, um, we are not requiring a composite G, uh, ACT or SAT for eligibility for dual enrollment. Um, the next FAQ is, if a student has taken the ACT and not met the minimum score for English or math, are they no longer eligible for dual enrollment? So again, this, this is, um, you know, we're, we do not want the student to be penalized in, these, in this situation. So regardless of whether the student has taken the ACT or not, any assessment that's listed in the academic affairs policy can be utilized. Uh, and, you know, many of you that are that deal with the eligibility aspect of it, ensuring that students can meet those requirements will note that regardless of the ACT, any of those are options uh, for the students. We also understand that the LEAP 2025 um, is not being provided. So that is why we went ahead and uh, offered all of those um, different assessments for you to select from. Okay, 
I've got another FAQ here for you. What if a student is taking a dual enrollment course on the secondary campus, on the K-12 campus, and the K-12 campus closes before the partner institution closes? My first note of advice is to contact your post-secondary partner. Um, if you are not able to contact someone at the institution, do not hesitate to contact our office, the Board of Regents, and we can provide you with a point of contact um, and information for you to get the information that you need. Um, okay, and we will have all our contact information at the end of this presentation. So, Lupe, I'm going to go back to uh, this particular chart. I think we had some specific questions concerning this chart, and so I'm going to let my team jump in uh, to kind of help filter those questions. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to, um, to take a minute and go through the list to see. Uh, I see a lot of people wanted it reposted. Just reminding everyone that this entire webinar is being recorded. And the webinar will be posted on the Board of Regents website. In addition to that, this, this chart is going to be uh, posted online as well. I do not see any. Um, I'm going to try to back up. Um, and Meredith, feel free to jump in at any point if something crosses over into the K-12 side. Let's see. Someone said, did I hear correct that next year, fall, Fall 2021, there would be no minimum ACT or dual enrollment. No, um, and y'all correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, this policy, this interim guidance policy is for, to get us through the current school year, the current academic year, and then for the next academic year, which is fall of 2020 and spring of 2021. So that's hopefully that provides some clarity. We are showing the, um, the, the chart again. I don't see, um, let's see. Uh, so seniors will not have to have the minimum 18 English and 19 math by January as in the past. That seems to be related to, um, academic placement of rather than dual enrollment because because I'm so, I'm sorry Meredith or someone else help me out here we need I think we need to be clear when we're talking about seniors that um, current seniors are already placed so they have a choice to make one two three as in placement for the seniors of 2021, that is correct, that you, you may use any of these assessments to guide that um, decision or counselor recommendation, um, including in January of 2021. Um, I'm walking up through. This is Lupe. I have a question from a panelist, Good. excuse me, from a, from a participant. Will secondary institutions be allowed to change the prospective dual enrollment policy? For example, we have set a 2.5 minimum GPA. Can the institution go higher than that? And the answer to that is yes. What we are doing is we're setting the minimum standard for the state. Uh, if the institution, for instance, in some cases, if it's uh, uh, courses that are prerequisites for other courses, I, I've noticed some uh, STEM uh, related courses will have higher GPA or higher ACTs. This is the minimum standard for uh, eligibility for dual enrollment, but there may be some courses that have um, a higher requirement. Thanks, Lupe. Okay. So we just had a question. Good. In the Q&A regarding if the academic affairs policy 
2.22 applies just for collegiate level academic courses or does it cover occupational and technical courses? I'm assuming that means does it cover uh, dual enrollment courses that would fall under the um, TOPS tech pathway in my understanding and Board of Regents, let me know if I'm wrong, that this is the minimum requirement requirement for any dual enrollment courses, regardless of their academic content or CTE content. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yes, if the if the course is needed uh, at the post secondary level and it's offered by a post secondary institution, then the then these placement scores do apply as well the exam. But again, going back to Lupe's point on this, this is the minimum. And so it's always possible that an institution can um, deviate from the minimum with what they use for placement purposes for their courses. But that's a good question. I have another question. Um, is it, this is Lupe. Is it up to the post-secondary institution as to which assessments in policy 2.22 are allowed? And I know the, the, the participant, Dr. Temple, uh, you know, we know some institutions offer some of those alternatives. Um, there's a little caveat in there that if the institution has another assessment that that, that you are using, then please feel free to contact Board of Regents and we can, um, you know, de determine to see if we want to, uh, we can add that to the choices. Board of Regents, we have a question regarding the what the counselor recommendation would look like. Could y'all speak to that more? Is that um, what counselors should be looking for when making these recommendations? So that's a that's a good question, and. Uh, much of the recommendation process will be at the discretion of the school and uh, the professional uh, discretion of the, of the individual that provides counseling and advising the students. A couple things that you'll find within the policy guidance is uh, the, the trend in academic performance uh, as well as the academic uh, rigor of the curriculum that the student has taken on up to the point. There may be other things to consider and, and all things can be considered at various levels and to varying degrees, but uh, flexibility is provided to the schools to determine and assess the ability of a student to be able to enroll in a post-secondary course. This is Lupe. I have a, another really good question. Um, on the alternatives that are listed in the policy, the alternative assessments, um, what years uh, of, of those specific assessments are we referring to in policy 2022? There are a couple of these assessments that are no longer being administered. We kept those on there since um, a student may have had those assessments previously and we just don't want to leave any options out for the students. So uh, if you are working with some of the newer assessments, uh, for example, the LEAP 2025, uh, you know, then we can we can use that um, or the next generation Accuplacer as opposed to the, the, the previous Accuplacer from 2016. Uh, several of the questions, this is Meredith from LDOE, um, Board of Regents, several of the questions are asking if there is a need to use the English 1 LEAP scores, since there is no English 2 LEAP being administered this year for students. My understanding from your policy is that the test scores are not needed, just the counselor recommendation, as long as they have the 2.5 GPA. Can y'all verify that for some of our participants? There seems to be several questions regarding replacing LEAP tests with prior tests. Yes, that is correct, Meredith. 
this is looping. Thank you for that. Um, I see some other questions that are regarding if they do not, if they take the ACT and they do not meet the requirement in the fall, does the counselor recommendation still count for the spring? Or will they have to fall back to that ACT score? This policy is, so for example, that's an excellent question. If you take the ACT in the fall, you do not make the sub score, this policy will still be in place. You know, and, and honestly, none of us have a crystal ball that we can look into the future. So we've tried to anticipate as many of the situations that we could, uh, you know, as we know, some institutions have already announced that they're going online for uh, this for summer school. We're not quite sure where we will be uh, for the fall, hopefully back to normal, but if not, we want to make sure that we had a policy in place so that students who wanted to take dual enrollment courses could do so. Thank you for that. I see another question regarding the counselor recommendation if it needs to be a form, an email, or a letter. And I believe that that is going to be left up to the discretion of the local um, district and partner institution, correct? Yes, this is Lupe again. That is correct. Uh, whatever form, um, you know, for instance, that would be something that I can see you working out with the institution, um, you know, whatever the preference is. It could be as, um, uh, an email that they can put for this that they can keep for the student's file or a formal letter. I, I would think that that's between the post sec and the secondary school. Okay, thank you for that. We have another very specific question that I've seen um, several of them come through in this same area or category. What if a student meets the English requirement for eligibility but does not meet the math requirement? Will the student be allowed to enroll in only the English dual enrollment course or in the past, as in the past, will they be denied the ability to enroll in an English course because they did not meet the math minimum? Is, is this a case where the counselor recommendation would cover both uh, English and math courses? Yes, it would. And now, now the, other, the other part of this is that if the student, um, is meeting the English but not the math, there is, uh, and actually this, this is, uh, exists in the present policy where the student can register for uh, dual enrollment in the humanities, so, so non-STEM courses. So for example, if you've got, you know, you've got the English, so you could register in art history or you could register in regular history, sociology, psychology, more uh, liberal arts related courses. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for us. We're going to go on ahead and move on. I do see that we have several more questions. Um, so at the end, we will take some time, hopefully, to be able to answer these. We want to be uh, respectful of everyone's time. So, Malin, let's toss this back to you and Board of Regents. <clears throat> and thank you so much for those of you who are putting in those questions in um, the chat box. I, we do have some in the Q&A. If you could utilize the chat box, that would be great um, so we can have it in one source, but we are going to circle back. Thank you for your patience in this um, process of learning how to best use a webinar on our end. I'm now going to transition to Dr. Susanna Craig, who is going to give guidance on SSPS data entry. Great, thanks, Malin. So uh, for dual enrollment reporting, if you've got any of your courses that are where your students have selected to transition to in progress or incomplete, uh, these courses will be reported um, using IP as the course grade for the SSPS file submission. If in the same instance, the student has selected administrative withdrawal, the course grade will be reported as AW um, if a student selects AW, it's not going to be included in the GPA calculations, nor will it appear on, a on the college student transcript. In addition, um, as you are recording this information, um, if it is selected 
counselor recommendation, we are asking um, that you use a new code that has been designated as Z for the counselor recommendation. <clears throat> this has been added and should be reported in the English math placement test type field for uh, preparatory students in dual enrollment. So if, if you're not using one of the test scores for whatever the multiple reasons for why a test score won't, wouldn't be used and you are planning to use counselor recommendation, then you're going to put Z in the placement, te placement, excuse me, placement test type field in SSPS. All right, and we have uh, just one FAQ. How would secondary schools code interim dual enrollment uh, policy? So further guidance will be issued by the LDOE concerning um, the uh, coding for dual enrollment on the secondary side. And I believe we want one of our um, of panelists to jump in and clarify information about uh, the Gen Ed versus CTE courses. Hi, this is Adam Lowe. Uh, just to add to that, because there was a, a conversation earlier where there was a question about um, does this Academic Affairs Policy 2.22 um, apply to courses that are part of the TOPS Tech program if those courses appear on the academic matrix. So academic affairs are the minimum student eligibility guidelines for courses that appear on the academic matrix. Those are general education courses primarily. Uh, the student eligibility, minimum student eligibility for courses that do not appear on the academic matrix are not governed by the, the Board of Regents policy. Um, the Louisiana Community and Technical College system uh, does have uh, placement uh, uh, guidelines for uh, a number of technical courses. So generally speaking, though, we're talking about general education courses here. These are the minimum eligibility standards that the Board of Regents has set, and each individual college or university uh, can then set requirements above and beyond that. Thank you, Adam. I'm going to transition now to Dr. Brumfield to bring it to our last slide. Yeah, so, one of our last slides. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, uh, Malin, and uh, just to really try to summarize uh, the the purpose of this interim policy is to do a number of things. Uh, one is to ensure that uh, students have a have an opportunity to either continue or discontinue their study based on the circumstances provided uh, uh, be because of uh, COVID nineteen issues. So this was in response to that. The other is uh, with regard to providing flexibility for those students to finish their coursework. It allows for those students to continue into the summer to be able to, to finish the, the coursework that they started earlier in the spring or for some earlier in the fall semester. The last item uh, that I would sort of combine with these two, three, with these last two, is that it provides alternative approaches uh, for uh, looking outward, looking forward into the 2021. Uh, 2020-2021 uh, academic year. We know that a lot of faculty and staff across K-12 as well as the students and parents themselves are trying to plan for those schedules uh, in the in the coming year and the opportunity to otherwise utilize a, a placement test, be it ACT, SAT, or another placement exam, are just not gonna be there right now. And so these are stopgap measures to ensure that students have an opportunity to pursue and plan for those courses in the coming year and then uh, of course for this current year to to ensure that um, what's what has uh, been started by the student uh, can be finished and completed uh, in a manner that works best for them so this is really a student-centered policy and we're working with both uh, k-12 and with post-secondary partners to ensure that can be accomplished thank you randall what I'm going to ask right now, um, we are going through the chat as much as we can to respond in the moment. 
Um, but we are planning, uh, since we've had so many great questions that I think all would benefit from, we are going to compile um, a frequently asked question from this webinar in addition to uploading the webinar uh, to our website. If you have a school specific uh, detailed question in addition to what you've already added in the chat, feel free to email us at dual enrollment at laregents.edu. Um, we'll be able to follow up with you one on one, especially for those specific questions. Um, and again, a reminder, the webinar will be uploaded to the Regents website. And as mentioned earlier, following action taken by the Board of Regents on April 22nd, this interim policy will be placed on the Board of Regents website. Um, before we go, I did want to take a minute to mention the dual enrollment task force. Um, we do have a few of our task force members on the line. I've been able to see their names uh, as participating, but um, Act 128 of the 2019 legislative session created the dual enrollment task force, and this group is composed of both secondary, post-secondary, and community members. Um, and this group has met seven times throughout the state since July and produced an interim report in February. If you would like to preview the report um, or also sign up for any future meeting notifications or notifications in general concerning the task force, uh, you can go to our Board of Regents website where we have a sign up for email notifications as well as um, the interim report on that website. So here is a screenshot of uh, the Board of Regents website as well as the specific um, link to that particular part of our website. Um, and again, I just want to echo, please email student those specific questions to dual enrollment at laregents.edu. We will be following up by uploading this webinar to our website and um, sharing out the questions that were uh, discussed today during this webinar, as well as the ones we were not able to get to. We're going to be working really hard to answer and follow up one on one with you. I want to at this time, any of my panelists, if you would like to join in, if there was any remaining questions that we wanted to uh, chime in before we go, I wanted to make sure that we have an opportunity to, um, if there's any remaining items, any of my panelists would like to uh, chime in real quick before we go. Yeah. There is one item in particular that I would, um, that I would remind uh, our audience um, based on some of the questions and comments that have been received. I think it's important to note that this interim policy is for minimum standards. And so it is possible that institutions will have standards that are above what the minimum standards call for. So uh, again, the, the options are provided to institutions uh, to be able to, to adopt during this time when there's a limitation with how to assess uh, student ability, uh, other measures for placement, and so forth. So uh, that's just something that, that I, would, um, I would encourage everyone to, to bear in mind. So thank you. Well, thank you for your time. I want to say thank you for all of those who have joined us today. Um, we hope that you and your family stay safe during this challenging time. We will be following up um, with uh, one